guest is Judge uh, Angelica Hernandez of the 105th District Court. Is that right? Yes. Thanks for coming on. Thanks You're the judge in Nueces County and Clayburg County, which is Kingsville, basically, and, and Kennedy. Is that right? Kennedy, which is Sarita. Kennedy, which is Sarita. And how often do you go to Clayburg and Kennedy County? Right now, the way it works, I'm probably in Clayburg County 60% of the time. Um, okay. They have a, a much heavier docket uh, up until about a month ago, the majority of the checkpoint cases, which is the Sarita Kennedy cases, were indicted in Clayburg, and that changed about a month ago. Where are they indicted now? They are not being indicted. Are they being referred to? The, because I do federal law, and I do a lot of the Fel Furious and Sarita checkpoints, and for the people that don't know, we use that slang around here, but those are checkpoints which are inland from Mexico Correct. on the major highways were in there. I believe they were set up originally for only illegals and they were later, I don't know legally that's a complicated issue. Now they also check for the drugs. They have also. canines pretty much present all the time as well. And that's kind of a comp complex issue. But nonetheless, there's a lot of drugs at those border checkpoints, which are by the uh, Border Patrol, right. uh, U.S. And Border Patrol. currency and ammunition. And currency and ammunition. And why aren't they being indicted now? They are not being indicted on the state level because the federal government is no longer able to reimburse. And Claiborne County is no longer in a fiscal position to continue to foot the bill, and neither is Kennedy not just with the resources of having to house inmates and transport them and then provide attorneys and then provide trials. So they've decided to leave it to the feds. The feds, which my understanding the main region is now going to be either Victoria or Houston that makes the policy, has said that unless it is more than 220 pounds, they're not going to indict. Lie. I and so, laugh. and no, I know, but <laughs> I it's a laugh. very, it's a very <laughs> difficult issue because now if they come across, if they get caught with 50, 60, 100, 150 pounds, they're seizing, but releasing the individuals. And then the feds decide at a later time if they want to indict. So a lot of those people may or may not end up getting free passes, but on those cases, um, there was a policy decision a lot of times. <clears throat> I think the feds would turn them over to, say, Claiborne County if it was under 50 pounds. Is that what they were doing? They Is were it? anything under 200 pounds because I had cases to even, well, I take that back. I had cases that were three, four, five hundred 500 pounds of marijuana. The feds were being very selective in which cases they were taken what they were taking and so I had three four hundred pounds of marijuana I had the currency cases coming I had the you know five thousand rounds of 50 caliber ammunition that was being confiscated I had that case come to me so they were being very selective and Clayburg was no longer able to financially support the prosecution of what should be under federal jurisdiction and but couldn't you you were taking because I've represented people in Claiborne Would, County for forfeitures of money and or truck, you know, right. tra truck and trailers. Didn't that supplement the income to a certain extent to help with well, the prosecution? You have, to, you have to remember the way Chapter 59 is set up, that forfeiture and seizure money is split between the district sure. attorney's office and the law enforcement agencies. The county does not receive the benefit. And so the county pays the attorney's fees, the county pays the housing, the county pays the inmate transportation, the county pays the fuel, but the manner in which 59 was set up, which is why I have begun discussions with legislators that Chapter 59 needs to be revamped. And if they are going to split proceeds, then they need to allot a portion of that back to the county because they, at the end of the day, are footing the bill. What, what does the, the district attorney's office put the bill for that they receive the vast majority of the money. 
Nothing. It goes into the chapter. I didn't know 59. that. I, it goes into the chapter fifty nine weed and seed fund, oh. and then they're free to use that for the benefit of their office. Now, if they choose, at times, they'll help the county out. They may buy a vehicle and donate it to a law enforcement. They may help with sending law enforcement to training or to help different law enforcement agencies with supplies. But at the end of the day, a portion of that needs to go back to Canada. That's my, that's my opinion. Um, well, I, I know. And, and, and I'm glad you're stating, you know, some opinion on, on public policy like that. I was under the false impression that some of these courthouses, nearly all the courthouses in and around this area, and in Texas that I've been to, the older courthouses have been uh, remodeled or renovated or rehabilitated. And I thought a lot of that was from the drug forfeiture money. It's not. No, a lot of that is the grant money. There, it's there was grant, grant money it's too. It's grant. And okay. Claiborne County is desperately in need of assistance and help um, in, that, in that realm. Uh, but there's just not the amount of grants out there anymore to assist with that. So that's interesting that right now... So it cut my caseload down. Um, in in Claiborne County, in where the, Claiborne which handled County. the Fell Furious and Sarita uh, border checkpoints, Correct. you have less cases now than you used to because there's not the funds to prosecute them. Right, that's exactly. And does that have to do with this um, this this program that cut back on funding? For the feds, does that have to do with that? I'm honestly, if I'm honest with you, I'm not quite sure where it came from. I just know at the end of the day, mm -hmm. Claiborne County was notified, and I don't know which proposition or which bill or which mm -hmm. portion of the budget you know it came from. But all I know is they said we can no longer reimburse. So if you want to prosecute it, do it. But who can who can afford to do that? Who who can afford to take because you have to. Sixty-five dollars a day to house an inmate. It's an average. Well, the of, court appointed attorney. The court appointed attorney, attorney has which, to make money. Even certainly. if it's a plea, I have now raised over in Claiborne County. I use the same fee that we use here in Nueces. and then if they want a trial, you're talking about a hundred dollars a day plus all the prep time. You know, I haven't written it out. What, well, what's a, what? Excuse me. What's a hundred dollars a day? Um, is the in court time? Oh, for the for the for the attorney. Hundred dollars an hour, you mean? $100 an hour. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then the jurors are paid some minimum then amount. Then the jury fees. and It's a lot of money. And and then just the cost itself of transporting. And, do you and, ha you, you, and under the state cases, you have to actually, unlike the federal cases, under the federal cases, they don't keep all the marijuana. But I think in the state, you have to maintain that marijuana to you show it, to, don't you? You have to maintain it unless you file a motion to court it. And most of the state, the DAs, for whatever reason, they want to they show it. Fight the coring because they want to parade. You well, know, I would too. If I, if, I, if, and, I, if I were the defense attorneys, I'll say, I would say, "Hey, I where's the marijuana?" It's the difference. There wasn't that much. It's you know, the I don't difference know, right? in role now because when I was a prosecutor just a couple of years <laughs> right. ago, I would have loved to dump a hundred pounds of marijuana right, out in right. front of a jury and right. say, "You really want to let this person go?" But now, as the judge and the fiscal role yeah. and the fiscal responsibility and the obligation to the county. The storage fees, the you know, the cost of Store, it. storing all this stuff is a major cost. The, the sheriff's department in Claiborne County has run out of room, and they are begging Certainly. now for additional funds to create another storage facility because they have to keep it and and all the evidence has to be maintained and inventoried and accessible. And when you're talking about various kinds of inventory, whether it's guns, whether or not it's uh, marijuana, clothing. It's a major task. But you want to know what the biggest part of the problem is? It, it, and, it, and I guess most people, it might escape them, but it's all my absconders. The majority of people that come through the checkpoint that are transporting these substances, they make bond and then they're gone. They're from out of state. They're from other regions. But that marijuana that was confiscated, they keep it. And the case is five, six, seven, eight years old with yeah. an open oh, warrant. Yeah. And Certainly. so you're talking about storing years, decades worth of confiscated drugs because there hasn't been a decision made that enough is enough and let's just dismiss the case and destroy it. I mean, and I can't make that decision. I, That's I, an interesting I, issue. I was in Claiborne know, County one time when they were burning up all the marijuana. <laughs> well, you remember that? You make it, <laughs> no, but I... They, they were burning up, they had all... 
Seems much like he was in the middle of a field. I thought so. <laughs> That's what they told me. They were, I, thought, I thought they were. No? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. They have to... I don't know how they do it. Well, I, 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 now, I may be incorrect. Maybe three years ago, they, Sarah, they said we're burying the marijuana. <laughs> and, and, and they said, you get, I, thought, I thought so. Well, how else would they, you, you say they there's a furnace or something? But they, uh, they well, have yeah, to, okay. They but have still, certain, the smoke, the smoke is going to come I, up. I think by the time they filter it, I think there's certain mechanisms that have to go and well, that, that could filter be. it through. I, I, I heard some. As, I, as, you might have a bunch of high school kids that, you know, climb a rooftop. Right, right, of course. Stand guard, I don't know. And the, 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 and in Clayburg um, County, though, um, when at the, at the checkpoints, you never did the illegals. You didn't have the jurisdiction over the illegal alien, uh, illegal aliens. No, but out. with the new law related to smuggling of persons, I do that now. I've already... I've already is that right? Try those, yes. I think it was Representative Hunter that. So under the new, you're, you're, excuse me, you're referring to there's a new state law, Texas state law, that allows these people to be tried under Texas state law. It's called smuggling of persons. And how is it decided? Because I have several cases in federal courts where my clients allegedly smuggled illegals into the states how is it decided if it's a federal or state case i think that if it's if they're confiscated at the checkpoint itself i think it's federal the oh, I cases see. i have had deal with when for example there is an evading in a vehicle and then there's a bailout on the side of a, of a county road and mm -hmm. everybody's running and the person gets caught and some of them are caught those come to me as smuggling of persons so how much how much is the average person who transports and illegal in the United States, how much do they get in a person? Three thousand is what. The, I, I just read twenty five hundred. Pretty the, close. The the testimony that I've had in the courtroom is three thousand a person. I, that's that's I, what I've been. Federal hearing. document that I read yesterday was two thousand five hundred. So, you know, I guess on you know. I rely the testimony because a lot of times we've I, had I, the I'm people just come joking, in, you know that. No, and not. it's so close that those amounts twenty five hundred to three thousand. You know, that's not a lot of money. No. Right. It's not a money per individual, but you have to understand the indictments I'm seeing. It's an 11 count indictment. It's there's 11, 11 people laid well, in the back then, of the trucks and all hidden in, and 11 at 3,000 a person. That's a little different number. And and what is the actual cost? I mean, there's no cost. They stick them in one hotel room, or they take you know one or two bottles of water. They there's no overhead for smuggling of persons for the person well, committing the crime i i don't know <clears throat> they have to <laughs> it's all profit <coughs> well they have a usually a truck of some sort right yes but normally they're going to use an older truck that number one they don't mind getting seized in case they get caught mm -hmm. so it's a three thousand dollar truck so they've got maybe the gas expense, um, but the people are walking a lot of the way. They walk over the border and they're picked up in the States. Correct. All the cases I think that I've represented people for, they were picked up in the States, not right. in Mexico, right? Right. <coughs> they have to get here, they get to a house, they get where they're supposed to go, and then they're on their way. And the major, the major defense to a marijuana case or to an illegal case is probable cause, I guess, right? Right. Probable cause to stop the vehicle. Right. Well, so I file a motion to suppress. I say, well, <coughs> excuse me. You had no probable cause to stop my vehicle, which had two illegals in the trunk, because I didn't turn on a turn signal. And then probable cause to stop, probable cause to search, probable cause, right? By the time the officer gets up to you, normally all the people in the back have jumped out because clearly if they walk up to the vehicle, they're going to see right? 15 people. And normally my, my experience has always been it begins with, you know, I try to stop the vehicle because they failed to do A, B, or C. They didn't signal a lane change. They were traveling above the speed limit. And then from there, each of the cases I've had so far, and I've they had... They have a dog. I, the dog alerted. No, no. Most of the time they, they have a dog. They turned into an evading in a vehicle. Oh, is that right? The person refused to okay, pull over. Okay, so then you have probable cause. So I've tried two of them. I've okay. already had two. They have a lot of 
You ever bring the dog in to see how the dog alerts? Well, you know, I have one of those at my house. My husband. You have an a, alert dog? My husband is a state trooper. He's That's assigned interesting. to the canine. Mm -hmm. um, he's moving into his second year, and so mm -hmm. we have a canine drug dog at our at our home. Is that right? And his name is Max. Okay, well, and and how does how? I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to tease you that much about, <laughs> about the drug dogs I, and, and, I, and how they alert. You, how do they like, They say hello. You have drugs? No, I'm just tease. Well, you know. each honestly, each agency is different in the manner in which they train. DPS um, train. With an I've been looking to try one of those cases for aggressive the alert. Time. They are aggressive alert trained, mm -hmm. and they bite, scratch, and alert in a manner that there is no mistaking that they are alerting. Some of them train passively, you know, but but okay. DPS trains aggressive. All right. So over there in Claiborne County in Kingsville, you, you were what's what's the percentage of the uh, case look, cases that you handle that are criminal? Most of is it was it sixty percent before? Is that what you'd say? No, uh, so you got sixty percent of your total cases. My no, sixty percent mm -hmm. of my time is yeah. in Clayburg. Um, what percentage of time are criminal cases over there? Eighty. Eighty percent, and twenty percent is what divorces, family law, and civil. civil litigation. Yes, I mean because the way it was set up, Clayburg County is a court mm -hmm. of criminal priority. So I'm supposed to give priority because over in Claiborne County, as opposed to Nueces, my county court at law has jurisdiction over family law. So the vast majority of family law cases go to the county court at law in Claiborne. Okay, so the county court, the county... County court at law, Judge okay. Judge Mendoza does family law. Oh, okay, so and she handles so divorces, she, et cetera. She okay. handles most of that. Now, she was primarily a family law practitioner before taking the bench. I see. So I get her transfers because of conflict. And over there, I also do CPS cases. Child Protective Services? Yes. yes so I if do. somebody's accused of um, abusing their child in some way. I inherit some driving of with, Driving with a DWI or something, you inherit some of those cases, yes. too. And actually, I think I've been in trial... I've been in trial more days in Clayburg than Nueces, and I've had several very lengthy civil trials. We had, when I came onto the bench, there were cases that were four and five years old that have been waiting for the their civil trial cases. in civil. And so we tried those, and most of them were three and four week trials. So they were the bigger one, what were they, death cases and stuff? Um, Death they, cases, et cetera. One of them was a water dispute, which I can't talk too much about. Um, mm -hmm. A uranium mining case because it's still there's still one issue left. That's um, that was like a four to six week trial, and then I had a DTPA real estate transaction um, fraud case that went. Those are complicated. That was a two week trial, and you know, but it helped because I had great lawyers on those cases. That that always helps. So. And um, in Kennedy County, what is the uh, caseload like in Kennedy County, Sarita? It's very, very small. And, and like I said, it was because the majority of their cases were indicted over in um, Clayburg. But the kicker is that you need consent of the defendant. The defendant has to consent to jurisdiction. So when a defendant says, no, I don't consent to it in Clayburg, I want my case in Kennedy, then we but have you to know, go back to I'm Kennedy. I'm embarrassed to say this. I was just in Kennedy in Sarita before a district court judge, and it wasn't you. Am I crazy? There is no other district court judge. I guess I'm getting my counties confused. I'm sorry. Unless, um, unless, I, had, unless I had someone covering for me on something, but I don't. Okay, I, 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 sometimes I get the counties confused, driving around in a state of, okay. Um, so, you're driving around to these counties. You live in Corpus Christi. You live in Cal Allen. You live in Cal Allen, and you travel to these counties. Do you get a traveling allowance or anything for that? I get mileage reimbursement from the state. What is it? Fifty-five cents a gallon. Same as it's the federal. Fifty-six point five now. Okay, and the um, you obviously are in elected position. So let's say that you're up for. Are you up for election coming up again? Yes. When is that? Now. <laughs> okay. So when's the election? In 14. Okay, so the election's in 14. And you have to campaign then. The voters in Nueces, Clayburg, and Kennedy County all vote for you. Well, hopefully. <laughs> yes. They, they all cast ballots. Yes. Oh, okay. That's interesting. 
So that's pretty tough to campaign in three different counties that aren't, because obviously, Claybird County or is basically an hour from Corpus, maybe not from where you are, but about forty-five minutes. Yeah, and Kennedy County is probably another twenty-five minutes. Okay, from so you make Clayburg. a circuit. Must be difficult to campaign in three different counties like that. It is. It 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 was difficult the first time, and I anticipate it to be difficult, but <clears throat> it's it's just necessary. I mean, and, and and you are running in a partisan election, and you are running as a Republican, correct? Yes. And you, you don't have, I think you told me right before the show, you don't have any opponents, right? Yet. Not, not as of right now. Okay. With the filing deadline is December 9th, so. The, um, we had a tragic, um, the tragic suicide of Judge Greenwell, and I really don't pay that much attention to the positions of the court, et cetera, but when I went up there, I noticed that your courtroom is actually right across the hall from Judge Greenwell's uh, court, so I assume that you were well um, you knew him very well. Yes, I did, and worked with him in the Court of Appeals for a couple of summers, and he was a very good friend and spent a lot of time going back and forth to each other's courtrooms. Without saying, I mean, obviously, you know, this is a very touchy subject. Did, was there any indication that you had of severe depression that may have led to suicide? No. no. Nothing? It was an absolute shock when when I first heard that someone had been shot there and and then i you get the news and you realize that it was judge greenwell and <coughs> no longer with us i immediately immediately mm -hmm. instinctively felt that it must have been a, a family law case gone awry or somebody got in with a gun and it must have been a situation where somebody else had caused the death it never occurred, occurred. to me that it would be uh, at Judge Greenwell's own hand. I I never would have thought that. He was just so calm and kind and always just so patient and even keeled. There was there was just nothing to indicate he had that kind of stress going on. Okay, and I think you had indicated before the show when we were talking briefly that you had a uh, little bit to do with uh, obviously the planning of the funeral, et cetera, because you were um, um, how, what were you designated at in order for that position? To the next of kin. Next of kin. The, the, his brother, who could not come down for it. Is, um, Ju is Judge Greenwell going to be buried here in? He's already been cremated, and um, he uh, he right now is is still with us. But the wishes of his brother is that his remains be scattered and he be released rather than placed in a columbarium or placed in a niche and. <clears throat> and I, I know you. I'm not of, a fan you, of that. You, you, That's what you know. I'm not I, a fan. I know. Of that. I mean, it, it's a very difficult situation. But at the end of the day, my my desire was to honor, to the very best of my ability, Judge Greenwell's wishes. Well, obviously, and, and he left very specific right instructions about that, and I felt it was my my obligation, both as his friend and as the person who kind of. Was I got this role of that to, to do my best to honor his wishes. You know, the media made a little bit of a cause that, oh, well, how could he have gotten the gun in the courthouse? It must have been a problem with security. And I'm, I told people, I said, well, this is just ridiculous. I said, for one reason, it says, I don't know the judges go through security. We and don't I, go and through I said, number two, even the attorneys that go through security, there's way that they're not searched. No. And then number three, there's an access point where they could just show their ID cards that they pay for. And in all honesty, I think, you know, that was a little bit <clears throat> inappropriate because if, God forbid, any of us want to take our own lives, we could do it in any, any place. It doesn't have to be in a, in a place like it, that. It wasn't an issue with security. The security there at the front of the courthouse, those people, you know, they do a very good job. They're very yes. diligent in what they <clears throat> do. But the judges and the attorneys, we walk through without going through the metal detector. We pass through that little side entrance, and we're not searched. So... Um, the, it was by no means a glitch in security. That's my understanding. The governor will appoint a Republican in the place of Judge Greenwell, correct? I, I believe that's going to be the case. Right. And uh, um, I guess there's several candidates. And then that position, is there going to be, there'll be a, the, uh, that election is the same as your election, right? Correct. Uh, so then uh, obviously a Democrat will have the opportunity to run against this appointed judge, right? Yes. 
But you were not appointed, were you? You no. were elected I, judge. I ran. You I was elected. Against the Judge Mignalis, correct? Correct. Okay. The, um, the sort of cases that, now you do, what is the percentage of criminal cases that you do in Corpus Christi? It's still going to be, well, I think it's a pretty even split. I, I would is say it? maybe 55 to so what's, 45. Yeah, what's the last criminal case? What was the last kind of criminal case you tried? Do you remember? Yes, it was this week. It was violation of a protective order for a habitual felony offender. Okay, so habitual felony offender means three felonies or more, right? Two felony convictions. Two makes you HFO. No, RFO, right? Repeat felony offender. One prior felony. Okay, okay, two prior. Okay, that, that's right, but it's three total, right? Don't confuse me. Maybe I'll answer your questions. No, 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 we're just talking. <laughs> and you, don't, you didn't know the questions, and obviously... You know, two. Two, two priors. The, thir the, third is, the third makes you habitual. No. Two prior oh. felony convictions, you're tried HFO for the current offense. Right, that's right. And then it's 25 Absolutely. to life. Absolutely. With no probation. So, so this person was a habitual felony offender with what? Violation of a protective order. Protective order regarding a family member. <clears throat> so, the, so in something like that, I would assume that you would look what the actual felonies are for. You'd say, well, look, these are violent felonies, these aren't serious felonies, or how would you look at that? Would you? I don't because it's a jury trial. Well, so that was a jury trial. Yes. <clears throat> and did the jury do the sentencing or did the judge do the sentencing? The jury found him not guilty in about three minutes. Oh, is that right? It's interesting. What was the, the so the, um, so it was apparently, I'm, I'm sure the prosecutor wasn't happy with that. I don't, well, of course not. No one's no. ever going to be, you no. know. But to Ms. Dorsey's credit, she doesn't take her job personally like that. She does right. the very it's best job she job. can do. With She's the facts. very professional. We all have, I mean, and, every criminal I mean, defense attorney. Of course she turned. gets upset, I think, because right. normally they they believe in their they believe in their case, I think. And so well, I, I think every even a criminal defense attorney, all, we all gone into court knowing that we can't win the case. The, the person wanted to try the case doesn't make you very happy. I think that's happened. So I'm sure it happens on both sides of the aisle. I think so. Um, what was the case before that? Um, I'd, I'd read a couple about a couple murder cases. They may I've still be pending, and you may not several, be able to. Discuss no, I've had several them. murder. I've had several murder cases. I've had several aggravated assaults with deadly weapons. I've had several assault family violence. I've. I've actually had to try a lot of cases, and I don't mind being in trial. I really, really don't. No. So, um, I would say I've had at least a dozen trials in the past. You know, one thing that came out at this um, last, do you follow, I don't follow other people's cases, either locally, usually, or nationally. Sometimes you can't help it, right? Because right. like the Zimmerman case, right? Right. The Zimmerman case, you know. <clears throat> and you know, just talking gossip, what I saw, I said, well, look, I said, I don't think the jury probably had any choice. They were probably given a jury chart, something to the effect that if you find that he, that uh, whatever his name was, Mr. Zimmerman, was in, was in um, uh, serious danger of his physical, whatever, his physical being and or imminent danger, and he had, you know, and he used deadly force, then you must acquit him. And then I research after I said that, I researched it some, and that was pretty much the case. The jury isn't doesn't look at everything equitably they have to follow the law the, the law that's given correct i think it's the difference in what why i i'm one of the only only judges and and i've been criticized for it and and i i know mm -hmm. it's fine i'm one of the only judges that will issue a gag order because i do not like the risk of having <clears throat> cases tried in the media and I believe 100% in the jury system. And I have found in talking with my juries after trials, they really do set aside whatever personal opinion they may have. Even, you know, and they say, our job is to follow the law and apply it to the facts. And, and I won't second guess it. If that jury in Zimmerman, despite whatever parts the media wanted to play to us, whatever hype they wanted to give us, whatever selective portions they wanted to report to us. If and that jury you saw, you know spent that. that amount of time 
and they saw the witnesses and they determined well, the credibility. But I don't think the jury, I don't think know? the, and, and I agree with everything you're saying and I understand what you're saying, but I don't think the average person understands that the jury is, act, is, is, is given select questions regarding the status of the law. The jury was not given the questions if you find that Trayvon, if you find that, whatever his first name, Mr. Zimmerman instigated or provoked Tra Travon Martin, then you, then you must find him guilty because he cannot utilize self-defense in, in that circumstance. Then it would have maybe been a different story. Right. But such a jury charge about provocation or instigation wasn't there in the Florida law. So I don't know that they had much of a choice except to acquit him in the fact circumstances. I think if that case had been tried in Texas, given our laws, I think you would have had a very different, because I think in our law, he might not have even been entitled to a to self raise a self defense at all. To raise a self-defense as an argument because of the fact circumstances. Exactly. If, if in, because it wouldn't have been warranted. That level would not have been warranted given the amount of confrontation. So, I mean, it, it is at the end of the day, to, to some extent, whether you agree or disagree with the verdict, I think everyone has to agree that the jury followed the law they had. So when you say you, that you issue a gag order, who is the gag order applied to? The attorneys? Yes. And? The parties. And the parties. And I think and I've does, issued two. And the gag order is the media allowed in the courtroom? Yes. See, a lot of people accuse the attorneys of wanting publicity to help their practices. But myself, and I think other attorneys who I respect, we just assume the media not be allowed in the courtroom. Have you, you've had that problem. You've had, probably had motions from defense attorneys before, right? I've had motions. And it's because they'll come in for five minutes <laughs> And they'll see <laughs> one witness that's against your client, and that's what it'll be on the news that night. Yes. And, you know, and then I know I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying about the juries usually, you know, following the law and respecting the law. But, you know, if their families see that one witness on the news, I mean, there is a chance that that one witness that was covered on the news, I, I mean, one way or another, I think it makes it could make it bad for the jury. But, but like Judge Greenwell, none of the judges I know will exclude the media. You have to think about it. Our entire system of justice is still based on an honor system. We give the jurors instructions, one of which is, do not allow yourself to be influenced. Do not talk about this case with anyone else, whomsoever, including your spouse. Do not research. Do I know. Not listen. Do not watch do the not, media. Do not watch, do not watch the news stories. And, and so you give that but instruction. You, and right, but it, it's this. I mean, what are we supposed to do? Because let me tell you, I'm one of the only judges in Nueces County sitting on the bench. I've had a, a jury sequestered already too. I had to deal with sequestering a jury, getting a hotel, a, getting them right. put up, taking the TVs out, making sure they couldn't have it. And, you know. That's it, a big expense. It was a it. huge expense, but if a defendant or the state does not consent for a jury to separate, and it was a very high profile case, it was a very media, you know, the media was everywhere even before it had reached the courtroom. It was one of those well, that from the very beginning it had happened. Um, well, maybe they would have consented. To allowing the jury to separate in the evenings if the media would have been barred from the courtroom because then there would have been less media influence. Is that possible? The media attention happened even before the trial started and so even selecting that jury was so difficult. Quite honestly I didn't know we were going to get it done. I, I really didn't think. Can we you tell when a case is going to get... I can never tell. <laughs> I can, you walk into a courtroom and a case is a big deal. I can never tell. Maybe I should think about it more, but I can never there tell. You been, walk into a case, you think you're just going to handle a case. No, All are, of a sudden, there's... There's honestly been times when I go in and the media is there and I ask Lori, what case right. are you here on? Right. I, because I have, I have very strict rules for my staff, 
my bailiff, my clerks, everybody, we don't call the media. Now, you know, well, we don't we don't do it. Well, if they somebody's can, calling them. Well, I no, I've got, no, I'm just teasing. No, no, I no. could believe they're not in your court, but I would Very tell you I've had cases Over where the, in, past, the media knew more about that case than than I knew when I walked I in would, many times. I would agree. I would agree absolutely that happens, and I don't want my court to be one of them because Cause they would report stuff. Here recently, I had. Let me tell you. Yesterday, yeah. yesterday I had um, I had defendants in my court that were there for arraignment on a case that got so much media coverage, but there wasn't any media there yesterday. We quietly brought them in, got them arraigned, got them well, sent on their way, and that was the end of it. And I know next week when they realize it's happened, because normally they start looking at it after. They get very upset. I guess the expectation is you're going to call and let them know, but we don't. We don't do that. Well, we and then the, the whole thing from the defense attorney angle too is, is like once the media picks up on a story, then you got to start talking to the media too. And you know, in all honesty, I mean, you get some publicity out of it, but I don't get. I don't charge for all this media. Right. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Oh, I got to say all this stuff. I, not, I can't charge for that. Maybe right. you know. So I just as soon have a. <laughs> Like a clean case, a small case, get out of there. But you know, that's not that's not all the way, always the way that it is. On your on your uh, civil cases, in uh, in uh, Corpus uh, Christi in Oasis County, you do a lot of these. Uh, you do a lot of divorces, right? I haven't had to, any a few really big divorce hearing, contested hearings. Um, a lot of discovery, <coughs> discovery issues. <coughs> the trials have been really related to commercial transactions, real estate transactions. Um, I had a really serious uh, personal injury case. The trial was about two weeks over in Clayburg where somebody was seriously injured. And um, Well, in the family law cases, I was just going to ask some specifics because... A lot of people are interested, I guess, in family law, having, getting divorces, etc. Sure. I do believe you are technically entitled to a jury trial in a family law case. I don't do family law, but I do believe you're technically entitled. Is that right? Yes. But it's kind of only an advisory opinion only. Is that right in a jury trial? I haven't had one yet in a family law Oh, you law haven't had case. one? Okay. So generally speaking, in a family law case, you're just divide, the judge is divide, helping divide. If they don't agree regarding the distribution of the assets, uh, then you say, okay, you get the silverware, you get the... Correct. Right. And it goes you that get, far sometimes, right? Oh, yes. You get the... Yes. Absolutely. Right. You get the... Do you want to know you Do get you want to know an interesting technique I have learned? And I can't yeah. take credit for it. It was one of the family law attorneys that yeah. suggested it in a hearing once, and I actually used it, and now I really like it. I make the parties make a list of what they believe they should get and what they believe the spouse should have right. in terms of non-personal items. Because right. sometimes there's sentimental things that one party will want to hold on to just for spite that, that's a given. But when it's truly community property, make a list and then they make a list. And then I tell them, all right, now. These are the disputed right. items, right? Okay. The list you make, you say, I believe I should have this. My soon-to-be ex should have this. She makes her list. I make them give the opposite to each other. Right. And the list that you made of the stuff you want to keep is what she gets. And the list that she made of what she wants to keep is right. what right. you get. Or they can go work it out and figure it out together. And Okay, so that technique work, works pretty well. And then there's the issue regarding child custody, of course. Uh, and then there's... So that's often disputed. Yes. Okay. And then they used to they, they change up the words for all this stuff all the time. I'm the primary. Is it, they still use that primary conservator and managing conservator. Is it, it, are those phrases still being used? Joint managing conservator. Okay, and, now, and and although now you no longer even have to designate somebody that does the primary residence. You don't even have to designate that if okay. you don't want to. You just both have joint managing <clears throat> conservators, and the child lives more time with one than the other, but. Okay. And then the man is always complaining that he's got to pay all this child support. And then he complains he has to pay all this child support, but he doesn't get to visit the child. 
I hear right? that a lot. You hear that a lot. Yes. And and then and then the lawyer for the government always comes in, state says, doesn't make any difference whether or not you get a right to see. That's a separate case. Yes. Right? Yes. And the man says, Well, you know, I don't I wonder about just talking policy, which I know that you're not in charge of. I do think there's some inequity there. There is. Because the a lot of times it is the woman who has the child's primarily with the woman and the, and she gets a free lawyer from the state, but the man doesn't get a free lawyer to arbitrate his whether or not he's getting to see the child, right? Well, maybe with the attorney general part, but with me upstairs, nobody gets a free lawyer. Oh, I see. So when it's not when it's brought by a private in the attorney general part, the AG's office <clears throat> tends to promote for the parent that has the child. Right. But upstairs, when they come up to the district court, if they're filing for contempt on child support or enforcement of <clears throat> possession and access or anything like that, nobody's entitled to a lawyer. If they can get their own, they get their own. And if not, then... Is, is there still a family... There was a family law court years ago on, that were in... They were referring a lot of those child support arrearages to. There, we do still, do you have, still have a have special that? master. Special master. So you refer, do the, those go to the it's special master or do you refer those? Judge. Oh, Associate Judge Brazell takes care of cases where it, it is strictly the Attorney General's office wanting to do review on orders or try to enforce um, the child support stuff. But if either party objects or if it becomes any issues related to changing possession and access, she doesn't have jurisdiction over that. That has to come upstairs. Okay, so she there's a an attorney in the Nueces County Courthouse that takes care of most of the, uh, or a lot of the disputes regarding the, just child support arrearages. So I represent the guys a lot of times, and you know, they're behind in their child support. <laughs> they got them in jail. The guys. I tell you what. I, I, I uh, represent the guys. I have made you know. You know there's a lot of things that I didn't think about before that I had to think about once I came into office. Certainly. And one of one of the issues, and everybody does it different, like I said, and I'm not commenting on any other judge and the way they do it, but I, uh, what is the benefit in the big picture? You have someone who hasn't been paying child support. Nine times out of ten, that child is already being subsidized through public programs or receiving assistance. And so we are already taking care of part of the expense for that child as a community, as taxpayers. Dad, mom, whichever is under the obligation to pay the child support that's not supporting we want to put them in jail. You put someone in jail for 90 days or 180 days for not paying child support at a cost to the taxpayer of $65 a day. Okay, we're already moving into six, seven, eight thousand dollars Then they get a cold, then they have a medical issue, yeah. then we have to pay their medical expenses. Then they want a haircut. We need to pay for their haircut. Then they have um, some other issue. And, and by the end of it, in order to house that person who still hasn't paid a penny toward the child support, we've expended twelve or $13,000. I, I cannot, I cannot justify that. And so I, I normally, my defendants, I will reduce significantly their number of days in jail, if any. Well, and, could, and that yeah. is a policy decision for me. I feel that that's what the taxpayers well, entrusted me to do. I, it's not that I'm saying they shouldn't be paying. It's not that I'm saying we shouldn't have some form of punishment. But to what cost? Right. And, how, and those guys I are do, hardcore. How right. do I do that? Right. The, the, the guys are, some of those guys might be hardcore. They have already $45,000 in right. child support. Do you really think putting them in jail for 90 days, they're going to come up with $45,000? You know, they're and, not going to. But my taxpayers have to pay $13,000 to keep them in jail, to try to teach them a lesson that they need to pay their child support. I cannot wrap my head around that logic when my job as a fiduciary as well and to be fiscally responsible 
you know, it's Espe especially if they've already been just justice and right. fiscal responsibility. I just, you know, it's I, w very I will hard. tell you, I will tell you that, I, you know, I, gosh, I have a war story. I had a client I was representing for Social Security disability, right? That's a third of my practice. So I'm representing him for Social Security disability. They lock him up. The Attorney General's office locks him up. Says, "Okay, you owe so much money." I'm not saying the man was perfect, right, or anything right. like that. Gotcha. So I, t I, I go to the Attorney General's attorney. I said, "Look, I'm representing him for Social Security disability. Well, how often does a guy like his age win?" So I don't know, but I'm representing him for Social. I think he's disabled. I could tell by talking to him. I could tell he's disabled. You know. At any rate. During the pendency, he's in jail. I won the Social Security disability case. I go to the Michael, okay, let him out of jail so he could get his past due benefits or start collecting his past due benefits. As long as he's in jail, he can't get his past due benefits. I say, here's the decision. You know, I couldn't get them to let him out of jail, and I had to go before the judge and almost make a scene, and they insisted on so much money, even though it was proven legally, one could argue, by whatever, adjudicator, that he, in fact, was disabled. And number two, he... He couldn't get any income. He couldn't work because he was disabled, and he couldn't get any income while he was still in jail. And I still had such a, a problem with it. Um, he, so I mean, so obviously that's just one anecdote, but that's the sort of thing that could occur if if somebody digs in and doesn't want to be reasonable. We, you have to. I'm by no means perfect at this. I'm still well, learning. Well, I've only got two years in, but what I learned and what I have learned is that. You have to tailor justice to each individual right. case, and you have to give the time and attention in order to do that. You cannot treat all of these cases the same. Right. Every person <clears throat> who doesn't pay child support is not the same. There may be some that work and do it intentionally. There may be some that don't pay because of spite. There are some that are down on their luck and they cannot get a job for whatever reason. There are some that are trying desperately to work, paying what they can, but the amount is just beyond their reach. There are some that are disabled, and you have to stop and give that time and attention. Otherwise, what's the purpose? Well, that's, that's what I think, too. I won't, and he's actually a friend of mine. It might have been before your time. <laughs> he was, um, he had... That what do you call it? The ma master's? What do they call it? The, the master's position of uh, referring for the child support case, you know. Mm -hmm. And he got, he got in trouble because he put a doctor in jail. Did you know that? No. <laughs> this is gold that goes back. I won't name the, the. But he got in trouble because he put a doctor in jail that said something like, "Well, I'll bring you back the check for the ch child support." in the afternoon. He said, "No, you're going to pay right now. I'll put you in jail." And you know, I, I think the doctor had. I shouldn't tell you, say this, you know, but he had some political clout or whatever, but he wound up losing that position of the, that you referred to because he was so adamant in getting that money immediately when the money would have been, would have been paid. So in terms of, you know, I, I would agree with what you're saying, that sometimes you have to take the facts and the you, circumstances you to, into... You know, you put the robe on and we're all human and you can have this tendency to want to say, okay, I, I rule and I don't have to bend because I have this black robe on. And I decide and I don't have to rethink it or reconsider because I have the robe on. And I have found the opposite to work for me. I feel like I, I have to listen and I have to bend and I have to reconsider. And I have. There have been times when I've sentenced and couldn't sleep two or three nights and knew I had not done I thought what I did was right at the time but, but whatever is not sitting well and and I bring them back and I well, that's good and I, I normally will bring them back and say look here's my thought process this is what I'm thinking is there anything you can tell me and normally the defendant at that point has had two days to realize where his <laughs> life is big headed sentence. and then they open up and they will admit the drug problem they didn't want to tell you about because they thought they were going to get in trouble. Or they will tell you about the circumstances and what they were going through that make me realize I needed a referral to MHMR, but they weren't telling me that and they're self-medicating or they're having aggressive tendencies. because, And, if, and it gives me that, that extra piece of information. And then sometimes they come back and they just say, 
I don't care. And then I know I did the right There's thing. There's hardcore cons. But, you know, those no. are honestly few and far between. Yeah, they're very few and far between, I, my M opinion. M most people have some yeah. type of issue that needs to be addressed. So when you put the robe on, is the robe hot? Yes. <laughs> and do you pay for the robe? No. The county and, and are you supposed to wear the robe when you're on the bench? I think you're supposed to. Okay. But not all the judges. I think sometimes they don't. Maybe just during trials or something. Is that right? Some don't. Some don't wear it all the time. Okay. And you talked about drug problems. So what is the percentage of people that are convicted of crimes in your court that you would say have a drug or alcohol problem? Real high, I would say. Huh? 85. And normally I see it, I take, I will, as I'm doing the plea, I will open it up and begin to read the police report and what I'm specifically, and for what, who's ever interested, here's a little insight into me. I open it up and I'm immediately perusing the police report to look for, was he intoxicated, were there indicators of drugs, if, depending That's on the good. type of the case, mm -hmm. were there children around, because then I know I got parenting classes. Uh, was the victim immediately uncooperative at the bottom because then I know my policy is a stay away order. So I'm looking for anything that tells me what programs do I need to get this person to to help them be successful on probation. And most of them, it's, you know, he came back from the bar, he was drinking, and when he's drinking is when he's mean, but otherwise he's fine, and that's why the family violence happened. Or, you know, it was, you know, a lot of them are state jail felony. That's a personal use case, state jail felony possession. Normally that's going to be somebody that's got a problem, and I accept the probation, and then I just ask them, look, I've taken the probation, you're getting probation. You need to tell me what are you using and how often so I know what program to send you to. You know, do I need intensive outpatient? Do I need to just send you to regular counseling? Most of them will tell you. It, but, but it's interesting what you're saying. Which, which I agree with, unless you ask them, they won't say, right? I have a lot of dialogue with my defendants once I accept the terms of the plea bargain. Once I take it and they know they're getting probation, they tend to be a little more open and, and the, they will communicate. They, the, they really do. The, the issue, though, I mean, and obviously I think on the right politically, a lot of people are questioned whether or not the drug or alcohol programs work. So we have programs. You've got, you know, obviously there's Alcoholics Anonymous as a condition of probation. Narcotics Anonymous. Not Narcotics Anonymous. You can put them to intensive outpatient. Intensive outpatient. Which and is normally STARS. Uh, that's going to be where they have to report more often, test more often, and go to more, more counseling classes. And then you have Safe P, which is a, a facility where somebody's locked up for... Nine six to, 12, to nine months or something. Nine to 12 months mm -hmm. normally with an aftercare program of six months, which we call the Transitional Treatment Center. And then there's you have S SATF, TF, right? And that's here local. That's in New Aces County. And we're at the Annex. You also have now the Wright program. <clears throat> um, and the Wright program has two tracks. You have a substance abuse track for people with active drug use, you have a cognitive track, which is for people who might have had some drug issue they're not really using again, but they're starting to make decisions that show you they're starting to head back on that path where they're going to start using. You begin to see them violating curfew, missing reporting dates, being found right. with people who have active criminal cases. You, you see them taking those steps that are going to lead to trouble basically and so you put them in the cognitive track to help them develop better judgment and thinking skills and basically appreciate the result or effect that their choices might have on their life um, so those are the majority of the programs that we have to Do, deal is with there that. still a boot camp program or do they get rid of the boot yes, camp program you have to revoke them and send them to prison for less than 10 years in order for them to be eligible for the boot camp and then you have to be able to bring them back uh, within 180 days. So that's how it works now. You don't. You're not originally sentenced to boot camp as a condition of probation. Anymore. You sentence them to. Well, you can. I don't do it. Okay. You you can do it. I I do not exercise and, and do, that option. Why Why is that? Is there a particular reason you just don't think it'd be effective, or? You... I just feel like. For me, the way I see it. 
if I'm going to give them probation, it's because I feel they can be successful. I'm not in the business of setting people up to fail. If you have to send someone to boot camp at their initial probation, probation. Aren't, aren't you almost almost saying, well, that's I don't a good think argument. you can make it anyway, so I'm just going to send you here to give you a taste of where you're going at the end of your term. Okay. I, I just don't think I, – I want them to be successful, and, and if I don't think they can be, I'm not going to waste the time. And I'll right reject the plea which I how, how about the, how about the an abuse you do they use that anymore in abuse I don't, I don't like it no I don't I don't order it an, for my people an abuse I used to see it all the time I haven't seen it in years and that's why I was asking it's about still it. available is it and I don't know about Nuasis, but I know it's still available in Claiborne okay. but I don't and that's a chemical that's a some <laughs> sort of a pill or something that you take which supposedly causes you to have a physical reaction a violent physical reaction to, to drinking alcohol. To Drinking alcohol. <clears throat> I, had a I had a client one time who said, "Why don't we just go back to corporal punishment and probation?" You have to well, I had a client one time, <laughs> time who said he didn't want to take it. He says because you're not allowed to drink salad, use salad oil, and he said there's a bunch of other stuff that could trigger it, and he was against it. But I don't know if he, he might. Have I don't know that. That's I think he true. might have been an alcoholic, <laughs> and he just didn't want to be on it. You know. For me, I just feel like, you know. If you're to that extreme where I have, to, you know, I can accomplish the same thing with a scram device without making you violent. What's a scram device? Scram device is going to be a monitor that goes on your ankle. And mm -hmm. if you ingest alcohol, it's going to sense it. And it's going to oh, send me, you know it's what? Going to send me an it's immediate, you know, we have Soberlink. Soberlink is a device that you carry like a pager. And it's going to beep in your pocket. And you have to take it out. You attach this little nozzle. You have to blow into it right there. It takes your oh, picture okay. it takes your picture and it gives us the GPS location and it sends within one minute the results of your blood That's amazing. by uh, email uh, and the probationer probably has to pay for that this well yeah how much does it cost Do you um, <clears throat> the sober link device is about a hundred and thirty dollars a month and the scram is more expensive believe mm -hmm. it or not the scram I think is like $200 and then there's also the ignition interlock device. The in $60 a month for the inter inter interlock device. But for me, I mean, yes, it's important to safeguard the community. But I I mean, this, I, if I'm going to worry about, about them, it's not just the drinking and driving. Some of them, if they drink, they're going to end up in a fight. They're going to, they have aggressive tendencies when they drink. They, you know, it's different risk. And so... I mean, I kind of, you just have to do your very best to, but that's why it's important to read. You've got to read, <laughs> you've got to read the reports and know well, who you, the person well, you is know, that and, you're putting and, and, on probation. And, and, and I would agree with you, and I think a lot of lawyers, we're reaching the end of our show. This is Judge, Judge Angelica Hernandez, the 105th District Court. She's up for election again with no opponent. But when you're saying about reading, don't you think some of us get too burned out to read? Well... In, in the truth? I think... Have you seen that? Absolutely. I mean, by lawyers and judges? They're just... I think so, but it's it's not a luxury that we have as judges That's when right. a person's life is in your hands. Okay. I don't get to say I'm too tired. I just don't think right. I get to do that. I want to thank you for coming on. No, uh, thank judge you for having Angelica me. Angelica Hernandez, 105th District Court, Judge of Nueces, uh, Clayburg, and Kennedy County. Up for election again. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Good Appreciate night. Appreciate it. We really got around. She's five foot two with eyes of blue and pretty as a queen. I didn't know her pop was a city cop and she was just 15. Good morning, Judge. Why do you look so mean, sir? And Mr. Judge, what can the charges be? If there's been trouble, I will plead not guilty. It must be someone else. You know it can't be me. I filed my income tax return, thought I'd save some dough. I cheated just a little bit, I knew they'd never know. I got some money back this year, like I always do. They'll have to catch me before I pay internal revenue. Good morning, judge. Why do you look so mean? 
sir and Mr. Judge, what can the charges be? If there's been trouble, I will plead not guilty. It must be someone else. You know it can't be me. separated just the other day last thing that she said to me was brother you will pay she said i'd pay her every week i'd better never fail i said before i send you a dime i'll die right here in jail